I'm Chris Farrell from the All Things Good and Nerdy podcast, a wacky weekend morning show, part of the Good and Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out right now. Shows on the network are individually owned and the opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other awesome geeky shows over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. Thank you for listening to the Intellectual Podcast. I'm your host, David S. Dawson, and I welcome you to season eight of our show. The Intellectual Podcast is available on all the major podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Please make sure to tap that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the show. We're also on social media, so give us a like on Instagram or retweet on Twitter. We are at The Intellectual on both platforms. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just look for Intellectual Entertainment. And subscribe to our YouTube channel and get notifications of our video podcasts and other fun content at youtube.com slash intellectual entertainment. We've also joined the fun on Clubhouse. Join us for continuing discussions with our guests and fun rooms talking about the entertainment industry and the latest hot topics in pop culture. Just join the Intellectual Chats Club on Clubhouse. We've even made it easy to find. Visit intellectualchats.club on any web browser to be taken to our club so you can join up. Now, let's get on with the podcast. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. The Intellectual Podcast starts now. Hello, hello, intellectual listeners. Today we are here with Annie Wood. She is an actress who's been in such films as My Sister's Keeper, Good Luck Chuck, She's also been seen on ER, Joey, NYPD Blue, and Becker. How are you doing today, Annie? I am doing pretty great. How about you? I'm doing great. Now, of course, I, um, I mentioned all of these things you've been on as an actress, but, you know, looking through your Instagram profile, you wear like a bazillion hats. Uh, you're a comedian, you're a writer, you're a voiceover artist. Uh, let's just start off with this. How is it juggling all of those hats? Um, You've got like five agents. <laughs> it's I do have an agent for each thing I do, but um, well, the thing is, it's it's honestly, it's really just three, the, and the three are, um, you know, on, on camera actor and voice artist. That's acting, so acting, and two is writing, and three is is art. I'm a mixed media artist, and um, yeah, so those are the three things, and how it is juggling it is. Um, well, it's a challenge, to be honest. <laughs> you have to, um, every day, kind of, I have to make a list, and I have to figure out what is most important, what is what is pulling me to, to create, or is there a deadline for something? Like, I have a book coming out, and so if a, my publisher sends me something and says, you must look at this, then that takes precedence. If I have an audition, everything stops, because I have to prepare for the audition. Um, if I don't have either of those things, I'm free to paint, uh, work on a series. Uh, you know, uh, right now I have something in a gallery. And so we just had an opening, a Zoom opening. Uh, so, you know, it, it really depends on the day and what's happening on that day. But yes, it does take some focus. <laughs> yeah. So I, what I what I'm really excited about in interviewing you, I think we connected over the fact that we both have Wood as our last name. Like yeah, that's, that's what true. first <laughs> brought us together. But as I have been learning more about you, I have so many of the same interests, and it I love that you have been able to take all of these aspects of yourself and put them forth in your career. So you're not just one thing. You're not just an actress. You are also an artist and a writer. Um, because I. Honestly, I aspire to do that as well someday out there right. in my career. Look, so yes. th this interview is going to be a picking, picking your brain sort of situation. Okay. Great. Um, so on the artist spectrum, because for me right now, all of the visual art is like a hobby. I teach little kids art and things like that. Oh, cool. um, what is your favorite medium to work with? Oh, I love this question. Oh my God, artists love this question so much. Okay, so I've jumped around from everything. The only thing I haven't really tried is is oil, which I want, I kind of want to try one day, but right now I'm obsessed with gouache. I'm, uh, yeah, gouache is, is my go-to right now. And I draw using uh, graphite and pen, ballpoint pen is, is very fun. I love that. Um, but here, let me show you. I'm yeah. Gonna, I'm going to take you over here. This is a series, you're the first person to see this. This is a, a series I'm working on. Um, this is a, this is my figurative portrait series of women over 
the age of 70, older women on gift wrapping paper because uh, it's my belief that growing old is a gift. And in this culture, we don't appreciate it in others very much, and, you know, which is upsetting because I love, I love senior citizens. And, right. uh, so for our audio only uh, viewers, I'm going to try oh, and describe geez. this to you. Uh, <laughs> so Annie has just shown me a painting that she did. It's on gift wrapping paper. It is sort of the background is like a sea of blue. There's different tonalities of blue with some white. It almost looks like waves through it. And then you have an older female figure with this long sort of gray white flowing hair in the foreground. So nice. hopefully that was a good descriptor. <laughs> that, was excellent. that was a very good description. Thank you. And uh, hopefully by the time this airs, they can go to your Instagram and maybe see this photo. Yes, yes, yes. Or we'll make a special link just for your uh, listeners. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, that'd be perfect. Then you guys can see if my description does it justice at all. <laughs> so that was the, the guaro paint. The, That's the I'm, gouache. Gouache. Gouache, which is, it's, it's a lot like, okay, it's watercolor meets acrylic paint. Okay, so it's water soluble, okay. so I you can re reactivate it with water, and it has just a nice consistency. And you know, there's a learning curve like with anything new, but I just really have taken to it the way I like to paint, which is you know, not not realism. It's more you know, it's very flowy. Flowy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Flowy. That makes sense that you would enjoy that medium because I I personally like the the texture and the thickness of acrylic. But you're right, like being able to reactivate it with water is would be very helpful. Yeah, it's fun, and and you'll so there's I don't know if you could tell, but there's a lot of texture because mm -hmm. I I mix it with acrylic medium. So you know, there's all sorts of those tricks that that you do. Uh, but I love texture. I'm a big fan, big fan of texture. That's amazing. The Miss series is called A Glorious Gift, and it's all focusing on older women. And that's my fourth one in the series, and I'm just going to keep doing them until I get tired. <laughs> now, have you always uh, worked on visual art? Like, is this something that you started as a child? No. Where did you find no, this passion? I, think, I mean, I've always, like, doodled, but, like, who, did, who didn't doodle? We all doodled um it sounds like such a naughty word it's not <laughs> um no what happened was honestly so six six years ago when my mom died something like clicked in me for some reason that i'm not quite sure of after she died i started painting and i just and the way I go into things is very, very passionately. If I like something, I'm kind of like laser focused on it. And so that's what I did. I laser focused on doing all this. And I'm not trained or anything like that. I'm just by instinct. And so I kind of went for it and I would draw and I would paint and I would collage. And I've always been a photographer. That's That I've always done since I was a kid. So I would incorporate my photography into things and I just kept doing it. And then here in Los Angeles, I'm from LA and I live in LA. Um, I looked into some local places that I could contact and contests and, you know, things like that. And I just kind of got into it and found my way. And it's been, so that's 2015. So that's six years ago. So, so I've only been doing that uh the visual arts for six years but every day and passionately so it feels like more it feels like that's, longer that's awesome i love that you find time every day to work and i i wish i could do that that sounds amazing i have a painting i've been working on for like over a year and it's just on the verge of being finished there's like little detail work that needs to be done that i've never gotten around to but that's Come kind on. of da vinci worked on the mona lisa for like forever so it's, yeah. it's all good there's no rules to Absolutely. doing painting. i actually kind of like the idea that there's something that you keep going back to and it's taking i don't know there's something kind of nice like you're massaging it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh, so okay so the visual art is a recent but the acting, is that something that you've, let, let's talk about all your layers of art. Um, when did you get into acting? So acting has been forever. That has been my go-to. I have a family friend who remembers when I was three years old, I put my hand over Carol Burnett's face and I said, I'm going to be in the TV. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> to this day, we're not sure if I meant like physically in the TV or if I really knew what I was saying, but it feels like it was always, it definitely was always part of me. Uh, my parents were not in the business, so I didn't come 
from a Hollywood family or anything. I just learned about it. And back then when I was a kid, there was no internet. So you had to like physically go somewhere, I think a library and look like on a cork board to see like acting classes or like, you had to like really do legwork, which I did as a kid. And I would tell my parents and uh, I want to do this. And and can you drive me here? And I had to be the the force. And they supported me 100%, which is beautiful. Um, yeah, so that's been my entire life. And Kent Bateman, who is Jason Bateman and Justine Bateman's dad, was my mentor. I was in a theater company as a teenager in Hollywood. And he was um, he brought me in even though I was a teenager and everyone else was grown-ups. Wow. Yeah. So today, I, I guess our theme today is folks who grew up in Hollywood. We, we had an interview before that was also a, a born and bred in L.A. Wow. Um, but, also was, not, but also not from a like Hollywood family. Yes. You know, like. Maybe I know them. Who was it? Oh, uh, <laughs> let's, I'll tell you at the end. Okay. Our focus is you. But oh. it, it makes me think of this question, which is, what was the experience like growing up in Hollywood? Because obviously, you know, as a kid, that's a very different experience than growing up anywhere else in the United States. Yeah, it's it's funny because like it it's tough because you don't know what to compare it to. You know what I'm saying? So it's like it's what you it's what you knew. It, yeah, right? it's it's how it's, do you compare that to something else that you yeah. don't know? Yeah. I mean, for me, I think the most important thing is is who's in your family is more important than what city you're in, because um, that's, you know, that's key. And my family was very loving, easygoing and, and trusted me that I knew what was best for me. For instance, I emancipated myself when I was 16 because I wanted to go on auditions without a grown up. And uh and my parents supported me in this. I took the test, the GED, you know, so I got my proficiency. Um, but, you know, everything was really planned out. Like I sat my dad uh, on the kitchen table, and I remember, and I said, and I pitched it to him, like I was on Shark Tank or something. <laughs> I, I pitched him the idea of why school is not for me, because I know what I want to do. I said, I love learning. Uh, I will always learn. I'll be a lifelong learner, but not the way they're doing it. I want to do it my way. And here's why this will work. And he trusted me and he knew I was smart, you know, and I, I'm just, I feel very fortunate because I got to do that. And I got to go after all of my dreams from the get go. But you, you know, you, that, you need that support. That's really special. Cause when I had that same conversation with my dad, he says, no, you're going to college. You're going to do what yeah. you're going to do. And yeah. after that, you can do whatever you want, but until, until you go to college, you don't get to make any choices. You know, my parents were older when they had me, like they, like back then it was, it was weird. Now people are having kids in their forties, but it wasn't the case then. So because they were older, they were a little mellow. My mom was from Israel, so she was an immigrant. My dad's American, but grew up very poor. So both of them grew up extremely poor, made their way. And I think, I don't know, that it, what school was, my dad became a lawyer, but he didn't go to law school, okay? He, after the war, after World War II, he came to LA and, um, and he learned, he, he calls it some Mickey Mouse law school that he went to. So some, so it wasn't like college because he didn't go to college, but he became a lawyer, you see. So he, I guess, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is it depends on their past to uh, yeah. what they think is possible. Yeah, he already had the mentality of you don't necessarily have to go to school for this if you can do the job. Right. So right. that's that's great. I mean, I think that's an important lesson for a lot of people because sometimes a lot of emphasis is put on training and it's like, listen, unless you can use that training to your advantage, sometimes it's better. Like if you can do the job, do the job, man. Right, right, right. Um, so, okay. So you, you were emancipated at 16 going off on auditions. Um, one, what was that like? Because at, at 16, if I had to go into, a, I, I was doing like theater, but going into an audition room in Hollywood, I think I would have wet myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you this much. I wanted it. I wanted it so badly. Like sometimes I watch those shows, you know, like The Voice or something where, or any American Idol or whenever when they're auditioning. I like watching the audition phase. The auditions are absolutely my favorite part yes. too. Yeah, in fact, I got to the point where I only watched that part and not the competition. <laughs> but, 
um, because I, I remember so much and how badly I wanted it and, 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 oh, and yeah, painful, but, um, I did not book much as a, as a teen. Uh, I really didn't. I, first of all, I looked different. I had dark hair and I, I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but at the time we're talking about now we're talking about the eighties. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the eighties, uh, Blonde, blue-eyed was very in for uh, Hollywood. Okay, very white, and my I'm Israeli American, and I lo- really did look. I had darker complexion. I had dark hair. I was exotic, which in Hollywood is code for ethnic. And so I, I really, honestly, that's I'm not saying that's the only reason why I didn't book, but I wasn't like I didn't really fit the mold back then. That has changed significantly mm. and, but I look like this now <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is hilarious but anyway um uh oh yeah so but no I wasn't terribly nervous about that stuff because I, because the wanting was so fierce you know when you want something so badly I guess at least for me uh stage fright was never a big not a big thing for yeah me. you just went in you did it yeah. so you said that you, you didn't book a ton whenever you were a teenager. At what point do you feel like you really got your foot in the door and got your, your motivation? Well, I always, I mean, I did have agents and I did do theater in LA and I was in a theater company with Ken Bateman and all that. So I did work in that way. Uh, but as far as TV and film, um, I'd say, you know, my big break was uh, in my 20s when I uh, booked uh that I was the host of a dating game show called Buzz in the 90s, okay? And uh, I was the third female solo dating game show host in the history of television. So that was like... Wow, like, yeah, that's because, big. Because back then, the, the note was, um, oh, people, men and women, not just men, men and women didn't want to hear the rules of a game from a woman. They, the women didn't have the authority, I guess, was the wow. idea. Yeah. And this was the name, right? And uh, and so there were people against my femaleness, <laughs> you know, being the host. But it didn't matter. My producer stood by me, and uh, it was a, it it was a really successful for the time it was on. It was um, on for a couple of years. It was nationally syndicated. I traveled the world promoting it. I hired my best friend to be my personal assistant. I was a guest on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I was on Bill Maher. It was like a whirlwind awesome, awesomeness. And at the same time, I was uh, uh, the star of a B movie called um, Banished Behind Bars, Cell Block Sisters. It was a <laughs> women in prison movie that has a cult that ended up having a cult following. So I these, remember that movie. <laughs> you know, David is very in on like the cult films. <laughs> oh man. So yeah, so that was fun. It actually really was fun to do. So uh, those two things. So I was in my 20s. Those were the big, you know, buzz. I co-produced it as well. That that was, you know, life-changing. I was able to, you know, to do the things that you want to do in life. Like That's life so are. cool. But, you know, yeah. I love that you were able to get on as a producer because again, as, as we were just saying, like at that time, I mean, for another producer to even let you in as yeah. being a woman and an actor yeah. instead of yeah. just viewing you as the product. That's yeah. awesome. You must have had a really cool producer. You know, the thing is because when he wanted me, he hired me to help develop the show because I had come from an MTV show as a contestant coordinator and I had a lot of names. And they needed names for this new show that they were putting together. So I come in, I have my hat on backwards. I was very Gen X. I'm like, I was uber Gen X. You know, hat on backwards, rock star t-shirt, me chewing gum. <laughs> and he sat me down, the producer, and he said, um, I want to show you this tape and, you know, t- tell me what you think of the show. And I just told him what I thought. You know, I just said, As a good oh. Gen Xer would. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, he asked. I wouldn't well, if you didn't ask, but well, it, yeah, yeah, you're not yeah. going to hear from me. But if that's you ask, right. that's right. I'll that's tell right. you how it is. <laughs> you know, you oh, know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, He's an '80s baby too. <laughs> nice, nice. So that's so that's what happened. I told, I told him, and he loved the notes, and so he had me come on to help develop the show. So because I helped develop, and I was already in 
by the time we got to the place, somebody didn't show up to host a run through, um, a guy, he was sick. And I told Stu, the uh, Stu Billet, the producer, I said, you know what? I know what you need. And I know what this show needs. It needs me. <laughs> Let me host it. So I hosted a run through and we taped that, filmed that run through. And that ended up being what we took around town to pitch the show and sell the show. That's awesome. Man, <laughs> glad he was sick, I guess. Yes. <laughs> well, and kudos to you for the for the chutzpah to, yeah. to say, I'm what you need. Thank you know, you. like this show doesn't need anything else changed yeah. except starting with bringing me on, you know? There we go. That's right. That's chutzpah is exactly how I say it, too. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Thank so, you. so you had this show, you traveled around, you got to meet a lot of people. Um, and obviously, like a lot of of this industry is a momentum game. So you, you had your momentum going, what happened next? Oh, that's a good question. So while I had the show, I was offered other hosting gigs, but I couldn't do it because I had the show and I was contractually obligated to the show. When the show got canceled, I went searching for those, but Hollywood doesn't like once something is canceled, you know, they want it when you're hot. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't have that kind of momentum as far as hosting goes, but I was still acting and I always was acting. I was doing voiceovers and I, throughout I was acting. Uh, I didn't have time to act much during buzz, but after that is when I reoccurred on, um, Becker with Ted Danson, mm -hmm. uh, and on those other things that you named. Um, also I was in a show called Costello, but it got, it was the first show to get canceled that year, but I did five episodes. It was a lot of fun. So I was, was working as an actor in TV and film after the show. Very yeah. cool. So, okay. Along this journey, obviously you were, you were born in LA. Um, have you ever, have you ever moved away from LA? Never. Never. Wow. So you, you've spent your life in LA. You are in the industry. Um, what are what are some gems of like advice that you've come across for young actors in the industry? Because I feel like you, you knew what you wanted to do at a very young age and have a lot of experience behind you. Um, yeah. I feel like you have some good nuggets. <laughs> I mean, it's what it's what I would tell any creative. It's is is that I would every day I would advise um, a creative to to remind themselves that. It's not just their dream. Uh, it is important. Creating art of any nature is important and is needed. It's necessary in this world. Uh, if anything, if the pandemic showed us, it showed us many things, but this is one thing. I mean, what, what did people do while everyone was quarantined? They read books, watched Netflix, uh, listened to music. They did all these things. Learned that to played, play music. Play music, that's right. Oh, <laughs> yes. All of these things, all these creative things nourished uh, our souls and it's important. So I encourage all creatives to continue being creative and remind themselves that what they're doing has value and to not quit no matter what, unless they really want to and want to go do something else. But if the fire is in them, you know, don't be the one to extinguish your own fire. I wonder Ooh. how. Oh, oh, that's a good. That's a good. Ooh, that was good. That's such I a good down. line. <laughs> Wait, I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah, don't be the one to extinguish your own fire. Oh, that's a beautiful line. Thank you. I don't think I heard it anywhere either. It just came out of my mouth. Okay, don't be the one. <laughs> she actually is writing this down right now, guys. Which gets me to my next point. Annie is a writer. And of course, this is a very writer habit. When you have good lines yes. and good yes. moments, you, you write them down. I don't know what this is going in, but I'm going to write this down. Lyrics, when the, too. When the muse you hits you. Forget. <laughs> you will forget. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, perfect. That segues perfectly into, when did you get into writing, Annie? So, writing, a lot like acting, uh, since I was a kid. Like, my dad's a playwright. In fact, I know I said he was a lawyer. He became a lawyer because his mother convinced him that that's what he should do, but he never liked it. He hated it. And he was always a writer. In fact, when I was a teenager, I convinced him to, uh, to take an early retirement because he used to give me his plays to read, like since I was 11, 12 years old, and he wouldn't let anyone else read them. He, had, he didn't have confidence in himself as a writer, which is crazy because he's really good, really funny. And so I would read his stuff and give him notes. 
and I was his go-to person as a kid. <laughs> and and so I convinced him to take an early retirement and spend the rest of his life writing, which he did. He listened to his teenage daughter, good for him, and he spent the rest, and he's still with us. He's 96 right now. Awesome. And uh, he uh, he spent the rest of his life doing what he loved, which is writing. So uh it's hard to think about myself as a writer without thinking of him because we're both writers and we're close and it's the writerly thing <laughs> in the family so i've always been writing uh stories poems and scenes a lot a lot of scenes there are some casting directors in town that just use my scenes my comedic scenes in their workshops uh there's a emmy award-winning tv director mary lou belly she uses my scenes in her ucla class so I have hundreds and hundreds of mostly comedic scenes, like two to five minute, uh, two person mostly scenes, um, plays, screenplays, books. I have a web series called Karma's a Bitch about karma coming down to earth and making people take responsibility for their actions. I play karma. And you can watch all this um, at anniewood.com. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. That sounds great. Uh, 16 awesome. episodes. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so... Okay, this idea of you know, you've been writing since you're a kid. Do you keep a journal? Yeah, many. I have. <laughs> yes, I have more than 20. It's <laughs> starting at age, I think, 11. And yes, I have them. I have them. And it is, it's so much fun to look back. I, that is something I would tell younger people to do is keep, a, keep journals. Because it's, even if it's just for you, because it's such a good time to open that up and be like, I've thought like this, what, <laughs> or, or that happened. I don't remember that, but then you start remembering. Oh, it's such a good time. I only journaled once in my life really. And it was when I worked on a boat in Alaska right after high school. And I found my journals like a year ago, year and a half ago. And I sat down, I started reading through it. And I was so disappointed because I spent the entire time being angsty teenage David <laughs> writing about the girl who'd left him at the end of his high school uh, year and not writing about how beautiful the experience was in Alaska. <laughs> well, was it beautiful or was it? Alaska was awesome? amazing and it was like life changing to do the trip. And it's kind of affected my I'll say yes to anything attitude of my entire adult life. But the journal is all about the angst of being a teenager. And the girl. That, sounds, that, you, that sums up teenagedom pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just too painful to read. So yeah. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> do you find that keeping a journal like that, do you find inspiration, like as you're writing your own stories, does that kind of kick off some of your creative stories as well? Um, yes, I'm a big fan of that. Of that, Like, what is it that subconscious... Uh, uh, writing or that is that the word I'm looking for no that stream of consciousness where you you just sit down and you don't know what you're doing and you're just writing and writing and then anything yes I find inspiration in everything in 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 everything everyone everywhere uh that's that's why I keep creating because I keep being inspired and that is definitely a way Excellent. Uh, so I'm really curious. So because every writer that we've ever spoken to, they sort of have their own, um, and I guess actors do this too, their own approach into the material. What is your process as a writer? What, or do you have different processes that you go through? I think I think um, I think I probably do have different, uh, depending on like, is it a book? Is it a, sometimes I don't know. Is this is this thing I'm thinking? Is this a play? Is it a book? Is it a, a song? What is it? You know, and I just kind of let it uh, ruminate, you know, uh, I'll go on the hammock and just be. Um, things happen a lot. We have a Vespa. Um, well, it's, it's a I used scooter. to have a Vespa when I lived in Atlanta. I love oh Vespa God. scooters. Oh my, so my husband's Italian and we go every year to Italy and so it, this is like a, it's a Piaggio. So it's kind of a cross between a Vespa and a motorcycle. No, wait, a Piaggio. Yes! A little silver one. Anyway. Yeah, silver one. Oh, yeah. my, oh God. my gosh. So, love it. So on the back of that bike is where I get so many ideas. And also sailing, like that idea of like this, that feeling. Oh, sailing is like 
totally inspirational for me. Yeah. Like every time I go out, I come up with new ideas. See? Yeah, there it is. Both of those make sense because you're in that you're in that zone. It's like taking a hot shower, right? Whenever yeah. you're starting, best ideas come whenever you're just completely relaxed. Yeah. And the your conduit yes. is is not got any kinks in it. Yes. Yes, exactly. So whatever that is to someone, maybe it's swimming, maybe it's walking in their garden, maybe it's having a cup of tea and sitting on their porch. I don't know, whatever it is, meditate, any of it, which I also. So you get the ideas and then, so I found, at least for me, I tend to know if I have an idea, I know the beginning, I know the end, and then I start to view the characters and then the characters inform how the middle gets yeah. flushed out. Yeah. What is it for you? Like, do you, what parts do you, what is the first thing that pops in your head after you just like idea? Okay, now this. For me, it's a scene, usually a scene, not an ending. I don't know. I would not say that I know how my things end, uh, usually. Uh, I, I often see a scene of usually two characters talking so it's dialogue i'm big on dialogue dialogue is my thing 100 percent um yeah and so i'll they're talking and it's usually it's usually these these two people are talking in my head so it's a scene between two people is usually how it begins and also it's happened where a title i get a title and i'm like oh my god i love this title it has to be something Sometimes it's a, a, a title that inspires more. Just as simple as that. Now, I saw you write, you have a book coming out or it already? Okay, yeah. tell us about that. Any Minute Now is called Just a Girl in the World. And it's about a 17 year old, oh, it's my first young adult novel. And it's about a 17 year old girl who's, whose dad is an alcoholic actor who left the family to go do summer stock and his co-star. And he left, <laughs> and he left uh, Lauren with uh, two younger uh, sisters and a bipolar mom who just kept getting worse. So this 17 year old has tons of responsibility. She takes care of the younger sisters, her mom, and then the dad comes back and, oh, and she's a poet. She's a closet poet. And she has dreams of her own, but she can't focus on her dreams because she has all this responsibility. Her dad comes back in town and wants to reconnect. So that's where the whole story begins just a girl in the world. Okay, yeah. wow. So th that sounds like a very exciting book. And because we were just talking about your process, I'd love to reverse engineer my question and ask what sparked the inspiration for this book? Okay, great. So uh, I remember that I was at some event, uh, I, like a panel, uh, some Hollywood panel years ago. And a producer, I think he was famous, but now I can't remember who it was. Uh, and he, he got up and he and he spoke about how he has a standing date with his daughters. Every Tuesday, he takes them out uh, to dinner. Just he and the, and I thought, oh, this is so sweet. And I like this story. And then my mind, as I'm sitting there listening, I started thinking, it's so sweet. But what if this father like was try wasn't so sweet like like left and came back and is trying and needs his daughter's love desperately and I, I just started thinking this could be an interesting story so i went home and i wrote a tv pilot okay called tuesdays with dad so, oh no that's tuesdays with maury called um <laughs> my my tuesday dad something like that i think so i wrote this pilot and uh, the pilot didn't go anywhere um, but I liked, I liked it as a sample, so I kept it for a while. Then I decided, you know what, I like this story and I like the characters and I'm, I wrote a screenplay based on it. Changed the title, changed some characters, added some magical elements, uh, but still came from that germ of an idea, okay? So now it's a screenplay. The screenplay, I didn't sell the screenplay. So, I don't know, a year or two goes by, I'm like, I still like the story and I like the characters. I, I thought I'm just going to write a book and I'll self-publish it is what I thought. So I write the book and then I decide to try to not self-publish it, to try to get a publisher, which, you know, can be challenging. Uh, I'm sure you, you know that that's a challenging thing to do. It but, sounds like a challenging yeah. thing. <laughs> I, but, I, but I tried and I wrote 100 queries. I said to myself, I'm going to write 100 queries. Uh, and then, and then if I don't find a, a publisher, I'm just going to self-publish it. It's fine. I did it with two other books. I'll, I'll do it. With. So the hundredth query 
the publisher accepted it. And so it's being traditionally published. And then he, the same publishing, speaking volume publishing, republished two of my previously self-published. So I have three books out there in the world now. <laughs> That's awesome. So, okay. What I really love about that story is you did not give up on, <laughs> on this like little spark of creation. Um, I, I read like the artist way and a lot of those books yeah, sure. and um, there was one, uh, the name is escaping me right now, but she talks about, this is not Julia Cameron, but another writer talking about how, you know, wherever these creative impulses come from, they'll be given to you. But if you don't act on them, they'll be given to somebody else who will. Not only did you act on it, but you like made sure. So it's like you were, you were, acting on behalf of this story and this creation to going above and beyond. And I think that's kind of really beautiful, you yeah, know? Thank you. You know, um, it's funny because I now that you're talking about it like this, um, uh, I guess it, this story, for reasons I'm not 100% sure, I guess, needed to come out. Because there are many stories, you know, that I will let die they can't all live they can't all live there's just too many so you know so i will just put put them aside but this one kept wanting to be born yeah you're right i i can't wait to see what the reason is you know like yeah. if it's it might just be a reader out there who like needs to hear this story and maybe then... you know you know how they say i'm sure you know that writers we all have themes that keep coming up over and over and over again in our work uh, maybe it ha happens with visual artists too, because even as a visual artist, in my storytelling as a visual artist, like this idea of you know the older women on wrapping paper, that it's a theme of mine that we must must love and, and treat our you know senior citizens better and all this. That is a passion. That so that is something. But as far as themes that come up, so much of it is you know, dance to the beat of your own drum. Don't listen to other people. Go, you be your biggest fan, be your biggest supporter. That's what I do with my life. And that is what I, I do in my stories. Not consciously, it comes out that way. And I'm like, oh, look, that's me again saying the thing I believe in, which is called my voice, which we all have our own voice. And yeah. uh, so I, I was going to say it, it yeah. very much carries forth the voice you put forward, which yeah. is, I believe in me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and that is, and, you know, and we all, in all of our, our, our uh, music, writing, whatever it is, we all have our own individual voice. Even if the themes are the same as some, uh, uh, that someone else is doing that theme too, obviously, but not in the same exact way. It's impossible. It's impossible because there there's only one of us. So, yeah. So I think it's common theme in this book, but maybe said in a way that uh, just needs that I need to get it out, or there's a there's reader or a reader out there uh, that needs it. Or many. I hope so. Many. I hope so. Now you said that you have a couple other books coming out too. So you have three. No, there. those are already out. Th those okay. are um, so Dandy Day and a Quantum Love Adventure, which is a parallel life uh, rom com. They're both uh, romantic comedy uh, type books. Um, they're on Amazon already. I had previously self published them. By the way, they were also screenplays that I made into book. Um, and Speaking Volumes Publishing uh, republished them under their banner. And then Just a Girl in the World should be out like any minute now. I just approved the cover. I did the cover art uh, as well. I did the cover art for all uh, three of the books. The, the art, and then they went and did the, the other stuff. <laughs> the book cover layoutness. But I, the artwork right. is not yet. Yeah. That's awesome. So these books are like very much your artistic fingerprint is just sure. this entire book from the visual to yeah. the words yeah. and story. That's, Definitely. that's really cool. Definitely. I love that you're incorporating all your hats. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so another hat that we haven't really touched on, I mean, kind of, uh, you're a comedian as well. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a comedian, but it's funny. That used to happen a lot when I was a host. So when I was a host, because a host is up front by themselves and because I talk the way I talk, which is kind of fast and comedian-like, and sometimes I you know, say funny things, so, <laughs> so I could see why people thought that I was a comedian, but I wasn't. What happened was I tried it a couple times, okay? Really, like a handful of times. 
And the first time I tried it was at the Improv, the world famous Improv out here in LA. And uh, um, Jerry freaking Seinfeld shows up, <laughs> surprise guest, and goes on right before me. This is, oh, no. yeah, this is my first time about because this is what comics do, uh, famous ones. They go to the improv in these places to try out new material without yeah. letting anyone know that they're going to be there. Yeah. So I and then he goes, he kills 45 minutes, obviously, and then I go on and do five minutes about my Israeli mother. And um, it was really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> I think I hats off to stand-up comics. It's hard. It's so hard. So I'm not, I'm not a comedian. I've done a lot of improv and sketch, but I'm not a stand-up. And you write comedy a lot. I write comedy in my, in, in my screenplays and in my plays, comedies and dramedies. Really, my vibe is more dramedy. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm not a stand-up. <laughs> so <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> Would you say that there is... A difference in technique whenever it comes to writing for comedy versus anything else or dramedy even? Not for me. No? Not for me. Um, the only, ex I mean, I've written, the dramas I have written, actors sometimes hire me to write uh, scenes specifically for them. It was a thing that I did for a while, which, which is I would write specifically for their type, not just type, but them specifically. So I'd have them send me a video of them answering me just a few questions or talking about their dog or whatever. And I would watch because I'm, this is, I'm very good at this. I could watch a person and kind of get them and incorporate them into the work. And so I would write these scenes specifically for them. So sometimes they want a drama, so I would write drama for them. And it was the same approach as I have for anything else. In all drama, there's some humor. In all humor, there's some drama. So that's why I say I write dramedy because to me, it's, 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 it's always both, just like life. Yeah. It's just life, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah complete, complete picture. Yeah. <laughs> Not just one avenue of emotion, but all emotion. And the best comedy for me has pathos. You know, Whoopi mm -hmm. Goldberg many years ago did a one woman show that blew me away. And I think I was a kid when I watched it. And I was just like, oh my God, what is she doing? This is incredible. And it was beyond stand up. It was, it was, she became these characters and you're laughing and you're laughing. And then it takes this turn and you're crying. And I was really moved by that. I loved that to have all of that happen in a short amount of time. That's, that's something I really like. <laughs> uh, that makes me think of another question. I mean, do you have any heroes within the arts or people that you admire and aspire to be like? Insp inspirations from the art world. Sure. You know, it's funny. I should make like a list and put it up somewhere because when I'm asked this, I go blank, but there's so many. Um, <laughs> there really are. So, okay, Nora Ephron, screenwriter, mm, yeah, uh, definitely. amazing. Dorothy Parker was a writer I absolutely adored. Um, um, artist Maria Kalman is um, she's an illustrator. She uses gouache actually, and she does kind of comic looking paintings. And she had a she had a show at the Getty before everything happened and we can still go to museums. Um, I really like her work a lot. Um, there's so many. Uh, those are the ones that come to mind at this second. I love Robin yeah. Williams as, a, as, a, um, as an actor so much. In fact, I wrote about the time I met him. I write a lot on Medium on the blogging site Medium. Mm -hmm. So if you want to read it, I'll send it to you. But I wrote about the time that I met him and, and I was just a kid and I went, my mom took me to see a taping out here of um, uh, Happy Days. And it was, it, it was the episode he did that then the launched. episode? Yeah. <laughs> the more weird spinoff, right? <laughs> yeah, it launched a whole career for him. And yeah. I was there. I was That's awesome. And everybody <laughs> wanted to meet the Fonz, but I only wanted to meet the alien. Oh. And I, that was a lifelong love of, I love his vulnerability. Yeah, his so, range, his range was incredible. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because if you go from completely manic yeah. to to wildly intimate and yes. and vulnerable, yeah. like yeah. in a heartbeat, and it was always believable. Yeah. It was so incredible how he could work. Yeah. One of my fondest dreams as a kid was I always uh, aspired to work with him. And uh, I, it was absolutely crushing the day that he died. Like, I just sat around watching old Robin Williams movies all day. Cause you know what? I can't even watch that documentary that's on Netflix yet. It's been how long? And I still haven't watched it because I just I haven't either. I watched it a couple and months ago. Was it great? It's good. It's really well done. And it really helps you kind of understand how he ended up where he ended up at the end uh, there. Maybe um, I'll watch it. Okay. I'll watch yeah. it. You've convinced me. I'll watch yeah. it. <laughs> oh, I won't, I won't lie. A... I cried. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I'm sure I will, but that's okay. We can have feelings. <laughs> we should. Feelings are okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Whitney will tell you, I have no problem crying like this. <laughs> Yay. Good. Feel your feelings. <laughs> David has all the feelings. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Good. But yeah, okay, that is, man, that is a great actor inspiration and how cool that you got to meet him as a kid. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know how to move on from that one. Um, no, uh, what, uh, what advice would you give? And this can be any piece of advice. Like, what is, what is the best piece of advice you were given about any of your arts careers? Um, this just comes to mind. It was something, so when I was a teenager, I worked at a talent agency in Beverly Hills. It was, it was after I emancipated myself, so I didn't have to go to school, so I worked, I, you know, uh, and so it was under the table, you know. So I worked the front office of a talent agency, and this was a big talent agency uh, at the time, and um, I, they also represented me, and I was up for a movie, and I really thought I was going to get it. They seemed to really, really like me. Uh, maybe I was like 17 at this point. And uh, someone else got it. And it was this girl that always got everything. And and I was, not only was I, you know, jealous, I was upset because of this specific thing that I wanted for me. So I was so sad and so, so heartbroken because that's what always it felt like when you didn't get a part or something didn't work out, like your heart is breaking because I wanted it so badly. So an actor, old actor, black actor, Gary Vinay, I don't know, I looked him up recently, actually, because I wanted to thank him. I couldn't find him. I couldn't find that if he's alive or what he's doing. Uh, I found out that he was teaching, acting, I guess, back in the day, but I don't know. I don't know. But at the time, I know he worked. So Gary Vinay, he said to me, because I told him why I was, he asked me why I was upset, and I told him, and he said, listen, don't you understand the exact right part is being created for you and you will get it at the exact right time. And he said it was such calm confidence, you know, that I just believed him and it worked. Like I felt better. And so I guess that comes to my mind when something doesn't work out. It's the exact right thing is being created exactly for you and you will receive it at the exact right time. It's like the Rumi quote, uh, what you seek is seeking you. So I think that that's some darn good advice. Yeah, that is good advice. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a very zen way of looking at it. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, be, pa be patient. Fate will find you. Like yeah. 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 We so I don't know how many of our podcasts you had an opportunity to listen to before coming on, but we are all about like the the connections with the universe and um. <laughs> And this fits right in with that. And similarly, uh, we like to always ask, what is your dream project? Because it's always good to put it out there in the universe. You yeah. know, the universe listens. So what is your dream project that you've not I, yet gotten to do? I have not yet gotten, I would, I've been a voiceover actor for decades. Okay. Commercials, video games. Uh, I voiced a toy once a long time ago. I want to voice an animated character. I want to be a series regular on an anime, a hit animated series of, of a part that I absolutely adore. That's so much fun to do. And I want to work with awesome people and have a great time. So an animated series, I have not yet been able to do it and I want it. 
<laughs> you I and I that. share that dream. Ah, look at that. Look at that. Maybe it'll be the same one. Wouldn't that Ooh. be amazing? Oh, that'd be cool. <laughs> Would be. And what what type of character, when you're envisioning this in your mind, what type of character do you think you would be on this animated I think series? I would be like this really, this kid who's just like really into like everything, like, like, um, like just like a passionate and like, and, and funny and, and, a, and, a, and a little goofy. And I would just be like a little, like an extension of me. <laughs> I love that. that was just like the audition right there yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful oh, oh my gosh <laughs> it was great well annie um it has been awesome talking to you we're actually already almost at an hour of chatting um final thoughts how do people get a hold of you uh things that you want to pitch all of the above yeah. <laughs> um so on instagram annie woodworld uh, the link, the link there is, you know, that brilliant link tree link that takes you to everything. So it'll take you to my essays and stories. I write fiction every Friday, uh, a story that you can read uh, on Medium. Um, and I write essays and all that. So you can read that stuff. You can sign up for my newsletter. Uh, what I share is I share things that I like movies I like or things I'm reading or things that it's called what I liked wrote and draw. So you'll see something from my sketchbook. You'll see uh, movies I'm watching and enjoying uh, and a link to some of my favorite medium articles. So you can sign up at anniewood.com. Um, I have a Kofi, um, yeah, Kofi account. Everything can be found uh, at Instagram on the link tree. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Instagram uh, hit the link tree. Touch, yeah. Yeah. Stay in touch that way. And um and I guess the final thought would be, um, this is, this is, I call this my three keeps. Okay. Keep creating, keep positive, keep showing up. Oh, awesome. keep showing up is my thing. Showing up is everything. Amen. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> my gosh. So much love bonding it. today. Like we're all just on the <laughs> yeah, same wavelength. I love it. Friends. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, I'm going to go check out your book whenever that drops. You said any day now. And uh, where, where can people pick that up? Uh, it'll be wherever books are sold, but you know, if you sign up to at anywood.com and just stay in the loop with me, uh, I'll be sure to send out direct links in my Perfect. newsletter. And my newsletter is only once a month because I think that's plenty. <laughs> well, for you, anyway. for you, or for us? <laughs> uh, oh my God! Annie, thank you for coming on our show. It's really, really, yeah, really you. nice getting so to know fun. you. Hello there, citizens. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the floaty that will not flush, no matter how many times you try. In the toilet bowl of crime, I am Darkwing Duck, telling you, please. Talk hard and enjoy the mindgasm. <laughs> Whatever the heck that means. After all, you are watching Intellectual Podcast with your ears. Yeah, this, this has been amazing. I like. I don't know that I've ever laughed this hard on one oh, of the yeah. podcast. You <laughs> tell me. Yeah, usually Whitney's really dry. You you brought it out of her. So. <laughs> Truth. Oh, it's it's the same last name thing. We're like we're yeah. bonded. We are cousins. <laughs> and Vespa owners. We're both Vespa owners. Yeah, so how we, about that? Well, I was a Vespa owner. I had I had to give mine up before I left. Uh so I had it in Atlanta and Charlottesville. And then I'm like, oh, going to California with a school. No, maybe not. <laughs> I forgot where where are you located now? Oh, we're in California.